Hello, everyone. Today, we explored a city of Sydney's plans for lower income households in high density neighborhoods. You'll be hearing today from Azel Easthope from the City Future Research Center at University of New South Wales about two neighborhoods with the same local government area in Sydney, both with considerable populations of lower income households living in apartments, but which provide markedly different day-to-day -day experiences for their residents. I'm Rodrigo Silva, and today let's talk about urban planning. Welcome to our episode, Hazel. Thanks, Rodrigo. Good to be here. So the first question for you would be, why is this topic so important? Well, a lot of research that's been done on condominiums so far focuses on luxury high rises, talks about things like their use as safety deposit boxes in the sky, how they're marketed to well-off residents. But in Australia, lots of people on lower incomes live in condominiums. And we wanted to talk about that and what it means for planners and what it means for housing development. Our cities. So I guess I should start by saying, what do I mean when I say lots of people live in condominiums? When I'm, when I'm talking about condominiums, I'm talking about private apartment buildings where each individual unit is owned separately. In Australia, we call them strata title. They're called lots of different things in lots of other countries, but condominiums is the um, internationally recognised. So we could talk if, if you want about some of the historical reasons for that, but okay, I'm getting I'm getting a nod. So part of the reason for that is that we have quite a small supply of public housing, and also we have much fewer rental buildings than in many other countries. So buildings that are built for the purpose of, of renting out. So essentially, if you rent in a private apartment in Australia, you're most likely renting in a condominium, which we call strata title here. So the result is that large proportions of lowering residents live in, in these condominium housing. But the other thing that's really interesting, I think, about the Australian case is that lower income condominium residents often live side by side with higher income residents. So it's not the case that we have neighbourhoods of lower income condos and neighbourhoods of higher income condos, but we, we have a mix of resident profiles within the same neighbourhoods. And I think that's really interesting when we're thinking about planning and private planning for private development, fully private condominium dominated precincts, to think about the, the mix of people who are likely to live in them. So that's that's really what the paper explores. How is this done? And we do that through two case studies, which are in the same local government area as you said, one of which we might call a best case or ideal scenario, and the other one is a much less than ideal scenario. Mm -hmm. So these are both neighbourhoods in the same local government area with the same local government responsible for their planning and the same state government responsibilities for planning, mm -hmm. but with markedly different outcomes for residents. And, and in the paper, we explore what's happened mm -hmm. through a detailed, in-depth dive into those mm -hmm. two cases. And uh, before we jump into the findings, what when you started this research, so what were you hoping to find? What was your research gap? So the, the paper is actually based on a, a slightly larger research project, which focused on how to plan high density apartment neighbourhoods that would meet the needs of lower income residents. And that project also looked at public housing provisions, private um, housing provision of apartments. And we thought that that's really important because although lots of lower income households do live in these developments, and in the case of private developments, lots of lower income households live in private apartment developments, their needs are seldom explicitly considered or catered for. So their needs as apartment residents, but also their needs. As so in this paper, we focused on the private story. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's, that's pretty, pretty interesting. Of course. And we wrote the paper because the contrast between these two neighbourhoods was so extreme, despite the fact that they're both made up almost entirely of private condominiums and they're in the same place. Of course, I think this, uh, I think this contextualization of how the situation, so how it works in Australia, contrasting to other countries and now jumping into this uh, research gap is, uh, was a uh, very, very interesting. So can you tell us what are the main findings of your article then? 
Sure. So I'll um I'll briefly describe the two the two case study areas. Mm-hmm. The first one we have called Upper Strathfield. So it's the the less than ideal case study. So to give you a kind of picture, of people who live in Upper Strathfield from Sydney, who we spoke to, they were living next to empty development sites. So sites where the, the previous houses had been demolished or had not yet been demolished, but no new development had occurred for many years, without the street upgrades or the park that they'd been told were coming when they moved to the area. The development in the surrounding area was delayed. That also delayed the contributions that the developer would have provided to fund local public infrastructure. And, for example, one grandmother we spoke with, she walks past these empty sites with her grandchildren to catch a train to go to a park in another suburb. So not an ideal outcome there. So residents who live there, they did talk about how convenient the location is. It is next to a major transport hub, train station, and a major shopping centre. But the closest parks and children's playgrounds are more than a kilometre away. There's no community centre. And residents told us there was nowhere to meet and talk or hang around. There's heavy traffic, which made walking in the area unpleasant. And the site is actually sandwiched between uh, the heavy rail line and a major highway. So then if we turn to the other case study area, Roads West, it's in a different area within the local government area. It's waterfront. It sits on a river. Mm -hmm. Uh, It also is walking distance from a train line. It has fantastic local parks. It has a multi-purpose community centre. It was designed with community input and funded and negotiated developer contributions to that community. Residents told us that their neighbourhood gave them a really high level of everyday amenities. It was quiet, attractive and an enjoyable place to live. And they especially liked the the waterfront walks, community centre and access to the shops and the trains. So those neighbourhoods are providing a really different quality of life. In the paper, we discuss how that was able to happen, and, and there are many reasons for that. One is, is simply the geography. Upper Strathfield is sandwiched between a heavy rail line and a major road, while Roads West is on the riverfront. But there are also other reasons. Upper Strathfield was on the edge of various strategic proposals, including a new metro and an upgrade to the highway, while Roads West was, was central and a focus as a precinct for upgrade. Um, that received both local and state-level political attention and associated with that more resourcing and uh, coordinated planning approaches. So the question that we ask in the paper or yes, the problem that we pose is how can this be allowed to happen if we can demonstrate through Roads West that we can achieve excellent planning outcomes for lower-income residents in private apartment developments, why aren't we achieving them in all developments? Um, And that's why the two cases in the same local government area are are so interesting. Or put another way, how can we try and achieve Mm -hmm. types of outcomes that we achieved in Roads West in places like Upper Strathfield? And so we explore in the paper two main areas. One is planning and public infrastructure provision and and the other is place management and community engagement. And we compare what, what happened and didn't happen in the two case study areas in that sense. One of the important differences in terms of base management and community engagement was the delivery of the community centre in Roads West. Upper Strathfield doesn't doesn't have one. And also a dedicated place manager position within the local council in Roads West, which wasn't afforded to Upper Strathfield, that was very important in the Roads case for achieving the positive outcomes Mm -hmm. that uh, were achieved. So why can't we achieve this in, in all neighbourhoods, not just in high-profile sites. Of course. So you asked before, what, what does this mean for further research? Exactly. Um, I think we've, we've demonstrated how by just looking at two cases in depth, we can really start to explore the, the politics of the planning process and also some of the, the good practices that we might want to replicate. And I would be calling for many other researchers to be doing many other case studies like this at that neighbourhood or precinct scale with a critical reflection on the planning process so that we can learn more about um, what we should be seeking to achieve across the board and also raising these political questions 
and not just assuming that private condominium developments are going to house wealthy, wealthy people and provide a good quality of life for, for them. So if there was one takeaway that I wanted people listening to this talk to, to go away with, I would say so long as we're primarily relying on the private market to deliver housing, lower-income residents are going to live in private condominiums and governments are going to need to intervene through appropriate planning processes to ensure that their needs are met. Or put another way, don't forget that lower-income people will live in condominiums too. Of course, an important punchline and still a lot of research to be done in the topic. Absolutely. Ezel, can you provide us to the listeners some additional resources about the topic that you discussed today? Some some other and some self promotion is a lot is allowed uh, if it's the case. So, can you recommend more materials for our listeners to explore this? Topic? I would love to, Rodrigo. So, there's a the report, the broader report on which this paper is based, was published by the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute, um, and I can provide a link that perhaps you can link mm-hmm. to this presentation to that report. Um, It has much more detail and also um, additional case studies uh, in the city of Melbourne. And uh, I'll also provide links to two news articles that we published in the conversation um, Mm -hmm. based on this project as well for for further um, background and and reading. Perfect. And uh, thank you, Hazel, for your participation here today. It was my pleasure. This episode is available on the Let's Talk About Urban Planning websites, on Cogitatio's YouTube channel, as well as in podcast directories. Hazel, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Rodrigo.